So we came to do our interview with Mr. Sanders. He's requested that he doesn't want to move. Just sitting here, living this life of luxury, the Iron Man life, glitz, glamour. Now, this is how you train for an Iron Man right here. That's how you get in shape for the brutality that you experience out on the clean keg. So we're gonna shoot all this from right here. Here we go. All right, so you headed over to transition. What, what were you feeling in your head, in your mind? Uh, for me, I just keep repeating to myself, business as usual, business as usual. Really, I made a pact with myself that I wouldn't even really let it enter into my brain that I was in the world championship until I was at 15 miles into the run. Uh, because, I mean, for me, it's just execute the best swim that you can, stick to your plan on the bike, execute the best bike that you can, execute a good first half of the run, and then you can let the fact that you're in a world championship enter your brain. So that, that, was, the, that was the motivation and the orientation I went into the race with. So when you head out of the water, where, where did you position yourself? Did you find some people around there? Immediately I found Keenley, and uh, I thought it was interesting, actually, all the weak guys lined up on the right and all the strong guys lined up on the left. So we all had already self-selected our packs and everything beforehand. Boris was with us, uh, Michael Weiss was there, Matt Russell was there. The only guy which I thought was super interesting, and I thought it was actually, I asked him and it wasn't, he says it wasn't a tactical decision, but all of us and then Josh Hamburger. And, uh, and I saw it just maybe 30 seconds before the gun went, all the guys, like all the strong swimmers looking around like, where's Hamburger, where's Hamburger? And he was way over with us. And I think that's how he got away uh, so well. And, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the race started and uh, I just kept Keenlay in my peripheral the whole time because that was my goal, it was to swim with him. And uh, I, kept him, I kept him in sight at all times. And at one point he was, we kind of, he started to my right and eventually he worked to the left and I worked to the right. And I saw him making a move because the pace in the pack was starting to slow down about two thirds of the way to the turn buoy. And I saw him moving up to the front on the left, so I started to come up the right. And then we met in the middle, and I went, got onto his feet because I remember watching the Super League broadcast, hearing Alistair Brownlee saying, anytime guys were swimming side by side, he would always say, uh, you know, bad tactical decision. They're at, he's actually slowing both of them down, creating drag. He should be on his feet. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I listened to his advice, and I got on his feet, and Keenley must not have wanted to lead because now he's in the lead of the second pack and literally I've never seen someone do this but he literally like stopped swimming and so it's like what the heck do you do so I went around him now I'm leading the second pack and I led the pack literally until we got until the very end Keenley came up beside me to my right as we were coming up to the stairs so I literally led the pack for like probably over two kilometers and uh the whole time I'm just thinking to myself I'm like this is not good, this is not good for us. Um, and I figured we would have a big deficit and we did, unfortunately, and uh, it's strange. I don't know what these guys were thinking. I mean, there's a lot better swimmers than I was behind me. No one wanted to do the work. I don't know, I don't know what, what, what was happening. Did you, uh, did you uh, study say anything on uh, coming out of the water? Uh, nothing was said, no, but uh, I mean, we knew there was, enough, there was no need for anything to be said. When I looked around at who we were with, I knew we had the firepower. I knew the, the, the perfect scenario had basically occurred for the bike anyway. Actually, even more perfect because I thought Cameron Wirth would have swam quite a bit ahead of us. At best, we went, might be on his feet and him driving our pack, but he ended up coming out behind me. And, uh, and so, I mean... That's potentially some of the biggest firepower maybe ever in an Ironman altogether. Um, and so, I mean, immediately that's what happened. We went to work and uh, I entered the, the lead of that pack somewhere on Kuakini. And then we made the turnaround, we came down. And then as we were going up Polani, uh, Cameron and Sebastian came by and Cameron was in the lead and Sebastian turned over to me and said, that's Cameron. Don't let him get away. And so I knew then that we would be chasing him for a while, and we did. And then I entered the lead uh, not too long, maybe maybe 10 minutes down the road. And I figured that's what we would do. We would just 
five, ten minutes on the front, and we'd all be switching turns. And uh, I was on the front for about ten minutes, and no one was coming by, so I literally said, come on by. And uh, then Boris came by, and uh, he pushed the pace for a bit, and then Keen Knight came by, pushed the pace for a bit. I think Cameron came by one more time, and then I remember at one hour, seven minutes, and 30 seconds into the bike, I entered the, the lead of the second pack, and I basically didn't leave the lead until I entered the lead of the race, which was right at about two hours, seven minutes, and 30 seconds, because I remember it was almost exactly one hour since I had entered the front of the second pack. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I reached the, the front on the climb up, Pavi. And of course, at that stage, I mean, this is now life dream and goal being achieved. I'm in the lead of Kona, helicopter overhead. And uh, I let a bit of the uh, emotion come in, the teeth grit. I think I might have swore a few times, yelled out loud a few times. Did you excited? Oh, just, I don't know. Anger is really the, the emotion that it feels like is anger. It's probably just... Uh, just some, you know, extreme emotion. I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's, it resembles anger. But I knew, oh, there's a long, long way to go, so I contained it. I pushed the pace pretty good up to the turnaround, and then, um, and then at the turnaround, Cameron, Sebastian, and Tim O'Donnell came by me. Cameron and Sebastian broke away, and I, I'm not known for my descending abilities, so... Um, I was happy to have Tim lead, lead the pack on the way down. And we gave up probably a solid 45 seconds to Cam and, and Sebastian. And uh, I looked back, and the pack was uh, pretty close, hadn't spread out much. And so I knew once we got to Kauai High, um, I had already planned to do a big surge if I was with the pack then and try and get rid of them. And so that's what I did. And uh, I probably surged a bit too hard because I had a carrot to chase after out in the distance, which was Cam and, and Sebastian. And I ended up pushing about 350 watts for 15 minutes, which is like my 70.3 race pace three hours into an Ironman, which is not the greatest decision. Probably uh, if I could go back, I would have been a little more controlled. But anyways, I ended up bridging the gap to Sebastian and Cam, and then we rode together for a little longer, and then I entered the lead for probably another 30 minutes, pushed the pace. I looked back and it was just Cam now, and then he came by me, congratulated me on a good ride, and basically that was him saying, see you later, I'm going to take the bike course record, and, uh, and I was content with that, I was fine, and uh, he ended up coming off the bike with about a minute lead, Sebastian was about 30 seconds down, and then, uh, and then I just went to work on the run, and unfortunately, with hindsight, my GPS watch was telling me I was running 410 per kilometer, so I, and I knew that wasn't accurate, but I had no idea how fast I was running. And uh, I probably went out a little too hot and uh, blew through a few of those aid stations a little too much because I started to hurt real bad at about 13 miles, like to the point where I was like really considering walking. And I started thinking, oh my God, like this is going to be a complete repeat from last year. I'm literally going to walk 13 miles and finish in like 30th place. And this will all have been, uh, this preparation and stuff will have been to finish in the same position. But at that point, I started hitting the uh, salt stick pretty hard. And um, I started to get a little bit of life back. I started to get my stride back a bit. And, uh, and then I was able to hold it together, you know, for another five miles or so. And then at the turnaround and at the base of the energy lab, I saw the man himself come and looked like a million bucks, looked like he just started the race. And uh, I knew then, he was only four minutes down, Patrick Lang, I knew. I had taken a split at the turnaround on, at, in elite, uh, on Elite E Drive, and he was like 10 minutes down, and now he's only four minutes down. So I knew there ain't no way you're holding him off. And uh, basically my motivation at that point became the longer you hold him off, the better it bolts for finishing second. So. That's what I did, and when he came by me, I gave it everything I had to go with him, but it was like, literally, it felt like my body, my mind could do it, but my body was absolutely not, 
could have no possible way to go about it. And, uh, yeah, that was it. He, uh, he dropped me pretty quickly, and um, it was a real, real struggle, man. I went through some dark, dark places on that marathon. Like, I don't know, I'm afraid to go to go back and do a marathon off the bike for, for a little while, I think. But um, it, was, it was a great race. It was a great experience. When you came by me a mile, uh, 10 or 11, someone screamed to set me behind it. You were cramping and you were injured and you were limping on your run. And you were <laughs> way better. Well, yeah, a lot of people thought that you were injured because of the way your run form was. What 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 well, what's, yeah. what's interesting about that is, I mean, I'm learning lessons and I've never, this is now, really, this is year one of saying I'm going to try and reach my Ironman potential. And efficiency and electrolyte consumption and hydration stuff is not really that relevant in 70.3. You can muscle through it. And I've been able to do that. And it appears right around 13 miles is where my efficiency problems start to come to the forefront. And I'm not a very pretty runner to begin with, but I mean, at 13 miles, things really go downhill, like really badly. And, and I do have a bit of a limp but when I start to at 13 plus miles, it becomes like, I barely, at, at by probably 18 miles, I could barely lift, my, I was literally dragging my foot on the ground, my right foot, because I couldn't, I didn't have range of motion anymore to lift my leg. And so, I mean, that's an area I think for improvement, both from a mobility standpoint, I'm immobile, immobile. And then also what was interesting at the finish was I started eating chips. I was literally crippled, like I could barely walk. And then I started eating chips and uh, Gatorade and you know, getting the electrolytes, getting the hydration status up. And my range of motion came back significantly. And then the next morning I woke up and I didn't have very, very much soreness. And I, I said after the race, I'm not gonna be able to walk for days. And so all these things added together for me says, well, it wasn't the speed, it wasn't the distance. It was something else that was limiting your running ability. And so now that's the new puzzle to go about solving as well. Maybe I can get more efficient. Maybe I can, I mean, I don't do any work to do strength and stuff. So as my form, I have no you know, base to, to maintain that form as I start to fatigue. And so, I mean, those are all things to improve upon for next year in mobility. And then of course, continue to hone the electrolyte and hydration strategy. So what's, what's going on in your mind since you uh, finished the race? You're just like, only the start? You've already you paid your dues now and you're ready to roll and start putting in the work? I mean, if my toes didn't hurt so bad and weren't like completely blistered, I'd be out training right now. But, uh, um, I mean, for me, my brain, the moment, I, the, the moment Patrick passed me, I was already analyzing how can I get closer? How can I contend with this guy for next year? and my brain hasn't shut off since then. I mean, this is the best for me. This couldn't have worked out any better. I'm so, like I got past at like one of the worst possible places, 23 miles into a marathon and got second. I mean, what, how much more motivation do you need? How much closer do you want to be to tasting it? And I see lots of room for improvement and uh, I'm excited, I'm motivated, excited. I know you got to take the recovery and I've been very good with that all year and I will. Uh, but I'm ready to get back into the, I'm ready to get back to my endless pool. I'm ready to keep working. I know we gave up a lot of time in the water and we shouldn't have. I know I can run a lot better than that. And I still got more room on the bike and I still got aerodynamic gains to make. I still have efficiency gains on the bike and I'm excited to go about gaining all of those. Absolutely. I mean, I think we're just starting to scratch the surface now. I think these, these races coming down closer and closer to the finish, more guys coming down to the finish, I think we're only going to see more and more of that, especially as, you know, you get really well-rounded athletes coming like Javier, who doesn't really have a weakness whatsoever. And I'm sure Yan's sitting pissed off as ever right now and uh, will be excited to get back and, and, you know, not only redeem himself, but take a course record or something, be the first to sub eight, something, you know what I mean, to, to, to rectify this year. And, uh, and all of those things, I mean, add up. We've got a lot of hungry guys, a lot of really talented guys. And uh, I mean, I'll be training in fear all year of them. Next 24 hours, I'm gonna sit here probably until the sun goes down and uh, 
sunbathe and live this, this glamorous lifestyle that I live.